Hi everybody, good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Leanne Gompert. I'm currently a fellow working for the Genomics Education Programme. Welcome to our fourth linkage webinar on repurposing drugs for rare disease. Just a few housekeeping, housekeeping items before we begin. So microphones will be muted and video cameras are will be turned off. At the end of the webinar, there'll be time to answer any questions on the topic. At the end of the webinar, there'll also be a QR code for our evaluation, which will help us to improve these webinars. So please, please do stay on and complete that for us. And in completing that evalu evaluation, there's a space where you can tell us whether you'd like a CPD certificate or not. So our speaker today is my lovely colleague, Dr. Hassan Shakil. He is an amazing academic paediatrics registrar and development lead within the NHS's genomic, National Genomics Education Team. He previously undertook an academic clinical fellowship in paediatrics with the Hurls Group at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge and his work within the Open Targets and Deciphering Developmental Disorders teams looked at developing computational models of disease phenotypes, comparing variant calling between different genomics projects and identifying new orphan drug agents for use in rare developmental dis disorders. So Hassan, over to you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Hassan. I'm one of the academic paediatrics registrars in Cambridge, and I'm also one of the genomics education program development leads. And today I'm going to be talking about my academic clinical fellowship work that I did primarily during COVID, um, which is the development of a new computational tool and algorithm that allows us to repurpose drugs that we already clinically use in a wide array of conditions for use in developmental disorders, hopefully to combat them. And as you know, and as a lot of us know, these disorders by and large don't have effective therapy, so there is a significant need to, to treat them. And this work was primarily done at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge. So by the end of this fourth linkage webinar, you should be able to describe the Open Targets platform and its utility. You should also be able to explain what orphan drugs are. You should be able to appreciate the basis of the Deciphering Developmental Disorders, or as I'll refer to it, DDD project, and the DDG2P database, or the Developmental Disorders Genotype to Phenotype database. You should also be able to understand the process of developing the tool that I undertook and how it is used to identify drugs for potential clinical use in developmental disorders. And finally, you should also be able to discuss the benefits and drawbacks of having such a tool in the first place. So target validation is primarily sort of defined as the process of demonstrating the functional role of the identified target in the disease phenotype. So to put it in perspective from a genetics point of view or a genomics point of view, it's to identify a mutated form of a protein or a protein target that we can target either using drugs or other genetic modification techniques. OK. OK, so first and foremost, let's talk about open targets. So open targets is a public platform. That is a compendium of protein targets point. So open targets. Open targets is a publicly available platform to a degree that's maintained by multiple teams, primarily the Amble EBI team, also based at the Sanger or in Hingston next to the Sanger. And the whole idea of open targets is that it is a huge scale partnership that uses human genetics and genomics data to allow systematic drug identification and drug target identification and allows prioritization. So when I earlier talked about target validation, this is a really effective platform to help us with target validation. The Open Targets platform integrates public domain data. So lots of, for example, trial evidence to enable target identification and prioritization. And the genetics portal within open targets identifies targets based on both genomic wide association studies as well as functional genomic studies. 
is a really effective method of aiding with target validation and is really key to the development of my algorithm. The next part is orphan drugs. Now, orphan drugs are drugs that are intended to de treat diseases so rare that sponsors are reluctant to develop them under usual marketing conditions because the R&D costs just can't be recuperated by making these drugs for these diseases. Put in perspective, uh, the process of identifying a new drug molecule is hugely long and hugely expensive. The slide says tens of millions of euros, but actually sometimes it's hundreds of millions. And it's also very uncertain because less than 10% of agents are actually effective and make it through to phase four, through phase four trials. Developing a drug intended to treat a rare disease therefore becomes very tricky if you use this approach and it's better to repurpose drugs rather than to identify new drugs and that's uh, another key part of my algorithm and we'll explore that a bit more in later slides. Orphan drugs can be defined as drugs that are not developed by the pharmaceutical industry for economic reasons or which respond to a public health need. And actually, the indications of a drug may also be can, they may also be considered an orphan since the substance used may be used in the treatment of a frequent disease, but also actually may target a rare disease. And this is exactly what I was talking about earlier and exactly why it's of interest to me with this algorithm. Now to think about the Deciphering Developmental Disorders project. The aim of the DDD study, and this is taken from their website, is to advance clinical genetic practice for children with developmental disorders by the systematic application of the latest microarray and sequencing methods while addressing the new ethical challenges raised by such methods and by genomics. The genomic data from DDD is stored within the Decipher database, and that's also important because this tool is ultimately going to be available through the Decipher database. And all of this work is sort of undertaken at the Sanger Institute with the Hells Lab. And a sub part of DDD is the Developmental Disorders Genotype to Phenotype Database, which is a curated list of genes reported to be associated with developmental disorders. And it has both the genes, the type of mutation, whether or not it's mono or biallelic, and the direction of action. And all of this is extremely important because it's relevant to the next part of this presentation. We'll move on to the actual algorithm. So the idea and the basis of this whole project is that we're approaching the era of individualized therapeutics. Indeed, this is the fourth linkage talk on gene targeted therapies. And all of these are individualized therapeutics to a degree. And there is an evolving international drive to use ex ex existing pharmacological agents in a broader range of conditions, and not just as orphan drugs, but also in other common diseases, so not just rare disease. So the idea we had was why should we not cross interrogate clinically employed agents with their known pharmacological targets, by which I mean the proteins that these drugs act on, and compare that direction of action to the mutation that has resulted in that protein having a disease, a disease state. I'm sorry if that's slightly wordy. I will explain it a bit more in subsequent slides. In a bit more detail, the whole idea of this project and my ACF was to accelerate drug discovery for developmental disorders by a determining all antagonistic drug mutation pairs. And but what I mean by this is that, for example, if you have an inhibitor and an activating mutation, the inhibitor should work on the activating mutation. And indeed, that doesn't always hold true, but that was the purpose of this computational project. And the second part of this project was to identify those drugs that already have a orphan status. And the reason this is important is because they're more likely to be granted subsequent orphan statuses if they've already been assigned one by whichever medical regulatory authority um, is present in that area. For us, it would be the MHRA and NICE. 
all of these candidate drugs, so all these drug mutation pairs, also went to proof of bioavailability test, which was partially manual. And the importance of this is by seeing that if these drugs are already used in, for example, epilepsy, one can therefore infer that these drugs would have activity on the central nervous system. So if the disease that I'm investigating, the developmental disorder in question, affects the central nervous system, one might infer that this drug is bioavailable there. And this is, of course, also an important step. Otherwise, we can throw drugs at various parts of the body, but if they don't work there, there isn't any point using them. Now, this is a, my method. I'm sorry it's quite wordy, but the main take home messages from this slide are that we are just over two and a half thousand mutation disease pairs from the DDG2P database. And putting them through open targets found that 323 had drugs that interacted with them. For a total of just over two and a half thousand drug mutation pairs. And the reason this number is so high is because a lot of diseases had zero. Indeed, only 323 out of the 2589 had drugs that interacted with them. But the range of drugs that interact with any one disease can range from zero to 48 drugs. That means that that number becomes very large very quickly. And then these were then manually curated, as I previously described to determine their bioavailability at the site in question to see whether or not these drug target pairs were actually likely to work at the target site in question. This is a quick explanation of the number of diseases that we were targeting. So as I've said, there is just over 2,500 from the DDG2P database. 323 had um diseases with drug targets of these with novel targets so ones that we'd sort of newly identified there were 72 conditions in the question and i'm sorry the writing hasn't come up great on this slide but of the total dr drug target pairs for those 323 conditions what we found was that 560 of that just over 2.6 thousand had an opposing direction of action to the mutation, which you have to remember is the whole basis of the algorithm. And what was really promising to us was that 76 of these drugs were already used clinically. So that means that these acted as a essentially a positive control for our algorithm. And we identified 484 novel candidate drug target pairs. And this is a really big deal to us because it means that only about just under 20% of these um, sort of targets have effective therapies um, and potentially we have a lot more therapeutic agents we could use in these diseases. Just to give you a broad overview, this is a sort of summary slide of the different types of agents of that 484 sort of novel drug and target pairs we had. Um, as you can see, the vast, vast majority of these um, are essentially inhibitors, as one would expect. And the second main category is blocker. And this is my first result slide, but don't worry, this is nowhere near the end of the presentation. So, as I said, we had 484 novel drug target pairs, and those 76 of the 560 that we found essentially acted as positive controls, telling us that this pipeline works to a degree. And then you have to remember, we were also interested in whether or not these drugs had orphan statuses. And we found that 109 of these 484 agents had an orphan status anywhere in the world um, by putting them through OrphanNet. And this is important as will become more obvious later in the presentation. But just a quick slide on limitations at this stage. Now the first, and I'm afraid this is going to get very genetic, is biallelic loss of function variants are very unlikely to be salvaged by activator 
activating drugs or by stabilizing drugs or positive, positive modulating drugs. A notable exception to this is that in KCNJ11 um, based familial hyperinsulinemia, diazoxide is an orphan target drug that works extremely well. Um, but this is sort of the exception to the rule. Also, the DDGTP database, so the primary source of data for my whole project, isn't complete yet, it's not perfect. And as a consequence, it means that quite a lot of, or not quite a lot, but a reasonable number of mutations direction of action still remains to be ascertained. It is also really difficult to suggest biological effect without actual testing in disease models, be these cell models, be these animal models, or indeed humans themselves. And therefore, we decided we had to sort of narrow down our approach to a degree. We therefore checked activating mutations specifically, and particularly those in clinically severe disorders ones that cause severe morbidity or severe mortality, as these are the ones that are likely to have most salvage or also be approved for potential limited trial use through orphan designation. So that's what we did. So we found that 44 diseases were due to activating mutations from 31 different genes. Of course, one gene can cause multiple different disorders. Diseases were then sorted by clinical severity, um, taking into account things like life expectancy or the degree of morbidity that results from these disorders. And we found that of these 44 disorders, 376 pharmacological agents could be used to target them through the algorithm and had been through at least phase one trials internationally. These were the breakdown of the different drug trial phases of the agents that I've mentioned on the previous slide, those 376 agents for use in these 44 diseases. And what's really important is to look at the phase three and phase four agents because they're the ones that have been trialed in disorders. They're the ones that have passed things like safety testing and we know a lot more data about them. And they're the ones that are actually used in diseases. And as you can see, they make up the majority of these drugs that we were investigating. Now, we found 11 severe phenotypic disorders and 14 moderate ones from activating mutations. And to a degree, we also took into account current treatments that are available for moderate disorders. As one may say that Krausen craniosynostosis is actually very severe, but with surgery, its morbidity is drastically reduced. And as such, we classified it as moderate. And I've talked about the other ways we looked at severity. So these are the severe disorders. They range from things like microcephalic primordial dwarfism to a well-known tumor syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2b and of course things like hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. And the results when we looked at these disorders is that there were 26 phase four inhibiting, blocking or negative modulating drugs that had been through, that had been granted phase four trials um, and that had an orphan status within these 11 disorders. There are also two phase three orphan drugs for these 11 disorders. There are also 61 other drugs that have been through phase four trials, but didn't yet have an orphan status and were therefore of less interest to us because they were less likely to be sort of quickly granted orphan status. Of the 28 drugs in question, so that is these phase four and phase three agents with a previous orphan designation, eight had at least one published study on PubMed the, the condition that we were examining them in question, leaving 20 novel agent and phenotype matches. Again, those eight almost acted like a positive control for our pipeline. And those 20 were the ones that we got interested in. 
To give you an example, pentanin type premature aging syndrome is caused by monoallelic activating mutations of the gene PDGFRB. We found three phase four orphan drugs that are inhibitors, nintetinib, hazobanib, and regorafenib, and one that is a phase four antagonist, glastigib, glastibig, rather. One drug, imatinib, which was also a phase four orphan inhibitor, had been used in one month old already with some success, and that sort of spurred us on to see whether this was possible in other disorders. So we then looked at hyperkalemic periodic paralysis type 1. This is due to monoallelic activating mutations of the gene SCAN4A or SCN4A. There's one known agent already in use, mesilatine, which is a phase 4 orphan drug for potassium aggravated myotonia and works well in a lot of patients. Again, acts as a positive control for this algorithm. There are also four other phase four orphan agents that could be used in situations where misalatine doesn't work. These include well-known anti-epileptic agents such as carbamazepine and also other drugs such as ridazole, rufenamide and lamotrigine, well-known mood stabilizer. And all of these are blockers. There are also 32 other non-orphan phase four drugs that could be sort of investigated further down the line if these were not likely to work. Then it gets a bit more interesting, I have to say. So we then started looking at our moderate severity disorders, and these range from things like a subtype of Noonan syndrome to the curry John syndrome, and as I previously stated, Krausen syndrome. The results for the moderate disorders that there were 39 phase 4 inhibiting, blocking or negative modulating drugs with an orphan status for the 14 activating mutation based moderate diseases. One phase 3 orphan drug for the 14 moderate disorders as well that had an orphan status and also 63 other drugs that didn't have an orphan status but had been three phase 4. So we were primarily then interested in these 40 phase 3 and phase 4 drugs that had already been given a orphan status. And interestingly, none of them had entries in PubMed when we started. That's a very important statement for the latter part of this presentation. So we then started looking at Cloves. Cloves syndrome is a is congenital lipomatous overgrowth with vascular malformations and epidermal nevi syndrome. It's associated with mosaic activating mutations of PIK3CA. We found two novel phase four orphan inhibitors, copanilisib and alpilisib. And the reason I put alpilisib in bold is I presented this presentation and alongside my presentation, when I first started talking about this algorithm, a group had started investigating alpilisib's use and used our sort of algorithm as further evidence that it should work. And what they found is that it drastically reduced the size of the lipomatous overgrowth seen within cloves. And this was really promising to us as it acted as another positive control essentially for our pipeline. And this is the um, reference for this for this study. I'll start talking about the limitations of this approach again to a degree, because I think it's important for us to think about. Many of these disorders, particularly in the moderate category, are due to problems that happen in utero. And that's important because if we give a drug postnatally for a problem that starts antenatally, it's unlikely to have a significant effect, particularly if it the effect antenatally is that it causes things like dysmorphology or indeed any organs to develop abnormally. And as I previously mentioned, it is also really difficult to infer biological effect based on a computational algorithm without actually directly studying it, either in model organisms or indeed within patients. And the final sort of challenge that we are coming across is that it's really difficult simply based on a computational algorithm to assign further orphan status to a drug. 
and this is something that there are, have been discussions with the MHRA about and will be sort of revisited on a single drug basis as more and more people hopefully use this algorithm and tool. Now, what does the future hold for us? As the DDG2P database becomes more robust with better mutation annotation and drug mapping, Hopefully our results will increase. The numbers of potential diseases and drug mutation pairs will increase, which means we potentially will have more treatments for developmental disorders. But also, if you cast your mind back a few slides, we decided to primarily look at activating mutations, but actually negative mutations, by which I mean loss of function mutations, also have several agents which could potentially prove to be of some benefit and result in some salvage in these conditions. We just haven't examined them in this arena yet. The results of this algorithm and actually the tool itself is now being embedded into the Decipher database, which I'm sure a lot of people here already use. And when you're just searching either by patient or by gene, if there is a drug target potentially within that disorder or the protein in question, Decipher should now flag it up or will soon flag it up. And our hope and my hope is that this will accelerate research into the treatment of rare diseases and allow us to repurpose a lot more drugs and give us a lot more orphan drugs to combat these diseases in the hopefully not too distant future. I'm just going to acknowledge a few of my collaborators and my supervisors. So my direct supervisors Professor Matthew Hells and Dr. Helen Firth at the Hells Group at the Sanger Institute oversaw a lot of this project, but it couldn't, it wouldn't have been possible without help from Ian Dunham and David Okoa at the EMBL EPI Open Targets Group. I'd also like to acknowledge OrphanNet and the National Institute of Health Research for awarding me in ACF in the first place, and to the Genomics Education Program for allowing me to present my work in this forum. Now, hopefully at this point, you should now be able to describe the Open Targets platform and its utility, explain what orphan drugs are, you should be able to appreciate the basis of the DDD project and the DDG2P database, you should be able to understand the process that I undertook to under that I undertook to develop the algorithm I have mentioned and its potential clinical use in the fight against developmental disorders. And you should also be able to discuss both the benefits and limitations of the tool that I have developed. And that's it, that's the end of my presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A. Any questions? Um, thank you, Hassan, for that, sharing that wonderful piece of work for us. Uh, what an amazing, amazing project. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. So I'm going to kickstart the Q&A session, if that's OK with you. Sure. So I have a question here. So at present, many clinical geneticists do not prescribe medications on a regular basis. So do you anticipate that with the incorporation of your algorithm, algorithm into the Decipher database, that this will become more within the realms of a clinical geneticist role or is the intention to highlight potential treatments for further evaluation through research? So thank you for that question. And it's extremely important, actually. It's identified a sort of core problem with the project and one I was trying to sort of, I guess, um, eloquently put together earlier. So yes and no. Um, I think it's going to be a very, very long time before a clinical geneticist is going to look in somewhere like Decipher and come up with this is the treatment you need to give simply based on what Decipher says. I think it, this will allow us hopefully to essentially research more drugs. But these, when I say research, I don't simply mean sort of model testing. I think this tool, especially with drugs that are already known orphan drugs in other conditions, this tool should help allow us to essentially do limited trials within the conditions in question, the ones one wants to investigate. Um, and that is why we came up with it. So 
So if a clinician were to look at the type of database and um, they came across a potential treatment for their patient with a rare disease, what would be the process if they wish to use that medication? Or are there any channels that they need to access to um, try to get their, their patients involved with these medications? So again, a very important question, and one I didn't delve into too much, but is actually very relevant. So for some of these conditions, the drugs in question are essentially off target and are very safe. Um, an example I'll give you is nifedipine, um, was thrown up in a lot of sort of the um, sort of tools that, or a lot of the diseases we looked at, um, and other agents like amlodipine. Now these are blood pressure agents, they have other effects, they have cardiogenic effects, but they could definitely be sort of investigated within sort of, you know, safe monitoring. I think what you're getting at, though, is some of the rare drugs in question here. Now, to sort of use those within, a, as I say, a limited clinical trial, one would have to write to the MHRA and propose it as an orphan agent. And that is a sort of stumbling block that we came across is simply based on a computational output. You can't say that this drug is necessarily going to work. And indeed, it could be dangerous until we actually trial it. Um, what I think is encouraging is a lot of the drugs we already use in these conditions or have been trialed in these conditions were thrown up through this pipeline. So the idea being that hopefully more will be. Um, and especially on my last couple of slides, that's what we found. There are people are already starting to use it to identify drugs that work in these conditions. So watch this space. Hopefully it'll work better. Oh, brilliant. Something to look forward to, I hope. I hope so. Um, so we've just had a, a question through on our chat. Um, apologies if I missed this, but can you please clarify the importance of a drug having orphan status and indeed exactly what you mean by that? I would have thought that repurposing commonly used drugs for novel indications would be useful. I think I've missed something here. Yeah, so the importance of a drug having orphan status is actually something decided by different sort of um, sort of medicines regulatory bodies across the world. So Japan does it differently to how we do it in the UK to how the um, Americans do it. But all of them collaborate with something called OrphanNet. So, for example, the MHRA and the FDA all put in data into the into OrphanNet to say what drugs they have approved for orphan use in which conditions. It's not just enough to say X is an orphan drug. For example, imatinib, um, which people here might know better as Gleevec, which is used a lot in CML. Um, it only is an orphan drug in CML and a couple of other conditions. It me doesn't mean you can just start using it willy-nilly in any rare disorder. Um, but what the reason we looked at orphan agents specifically was once a drug has an orphan designation anywhere in the world, it's actually much, much, much easier to get a limited trial use, i.e. another orphan designation for a different disorder. Um, and that means hopefully it can accelerate research within this field um, and sort of accelerate research within these conditions. Um, if you identify a potential sort of target that is already an orphan. Um, so that's what I meant by orphan drugs. Um, and the second part of the question was, um, I think you talked about repurposing I would have thought that repurposing commonly used drugs for novel indications would be useful. So it absolutely is, but I think we have to do that within a sort of safe space, so to speak. We can't just go using these drugs when we don't fully know what biological effect they're going to have them have in that condition, or indeed the systemic effect they're going to have, which is why even though this tool will allow us to identify ones that may work, we still need to essentially cross the T's and dot the I's and trial them um, and publish our trials because then hopefully we'll get a much better compendium over time. Um, so with Alpalisib, for example, if you now look at um, clothes within decipher a patient with clothes, for example, um, it brings up Alpalisib and says that actually it brings up the trial as well and says it works or it should work. Doesn't mean it's always going to work, but it will, this is what we actually want the tool to become is a, essentially an, almost an open platform for people to report these 
files. Um, and it, you know, makes us feel better that we developed the tool in the first place. So. And speaking of publications, actually, so uh, the next question that's come through the chat is, can you point us to published papers that summarise your work, Hassan? Yeah, so um, our, the big paper that we're um, sort of going to be, that we are in the process of publishing, will hopefully, hopefully, it's currently undergoing a third round of reviewer comments um, in Nature Genetics, so watch the space, hopefully it'll be available soon. Um, but the Cloves paper that I talked about, and indeed a couple of the others, um, that are relevant to this um, will be posted essentially when this goes live. So when this is viewable on YouTube, you'll be able to look at the close re reference I referenced earlier. And within the sort of comment section, I'll also drop in a couple more papers that we've had since. Um, but our big one, we're still undergoing sort of review or commentary. Um, this work has been published in other fields as well, as in I've published it through the Genomics of Rare Diseases Conference, um, which was held at the Sanger, um, and they published it as an abstract, but of course that's not a detailed account of what the tool is. Wonderful, thank you. So hopefully that's something else that we can look forward to in the near future to, to read more about this algorithm that you've created and, and how you've done that. Thank you. Brilliant. So I think we will draw today's webinar to a close in that case. So again, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Thank you again to Hassan for sharing that wonderful piece of work for us um, and certainly food for, for thought for the future. Um, just one final comment to um, all of the attendees here. Please, please, once again, um, do complete, complete that feedback form. I believe the um, link may now be in the, the chat chat to complete that um, feedback form. Um, the next webinar is in three weeks time on the 11th of May, Thursday the 11th of May. It's going to be presented by paediatric oncologist and Sanger Institute researcher Dr Sam Bajati and he's going to be talking about targeted chemotherapy agents in children with cancer. Um, and so we hope to see you there. Many thanks to everyone and I hope you have a lovely evening. Take care.